Hi everyone, it's Francine McKinnis. I'm just getting us set up for our live session at noon. Welcome if you're already logging in. Hi everyone. If you're already logging in, maybe you can just um, say hello in the chat box. Uh, we're going to be starting shortly in just a couple of minutes. Also, if you're arriving, um, a couple of questions that I would have for you. Uh, one would be what kind of habits you're working on or contemplating starting. Um, or also, um, what of if you watch the video, what of what of the topics I might have covered you were most interested in hearing more about? Hey, how are you doing? I think we uh, met on the last one. I'm glad you're joining. Hmm. Hi to everyone who might be just joining. Hello, Paula. Hello, Priscilla. Um, if you're just joining, we're just waiting a couple minutes to get started. If you feel like it, maybe you can put in the chat box. Um, hellos are nice um, to, so that I know who, who's joined us. If you want to put what habits you're working on or thinking about working on. Also, um, if there was something in the video that you'd like to hear more about. I, I will recap some of those points, but uh, if there's something you'd like to hear a few more words about, feel free to pop that in the chat box as well. We won't be long, maybe another minute or two. Hey everyone. Hello M. Welcome. So for those of you who are just joining, we're just warming up, waiting for the folks to arrive. Um, maybe just say hello in the chat box so I know you're joining in. Um, you're trying to reduce my waist. Oh, interesting. Waste generation and exercise. Oh, thanks, Natalie. Oh, also, if you, um, uh, I, I didn't put this, I, this should be a bilingual session, so if ever you wanted to put your comments and questions in French, we can tackle that on the fly. Um, so those who are joining, maybe you can put in hello to know who, that we've joined you and what you're working on. We've got a couple of ideas here um, from Natalie about what she's working on. We're just coming on to 12 o'clock, so I'll get started in just a moment. Okay, well, why don't I start and we'll let people keep joining. Um, so today we're talking about um, forming sustainable habits, which I think uh, is certainly on my mind when, uh, when all of the health directives came out, it was I have to say it was the first thing I went to because I realized how much of my activity, um, so many of my habits are my mental health habits. So, and a lot of those were outside the home. A lot of those were with others in direct contact. So I had to quickly um, shift that. And I think that's something to be really mindful of. Um, oh, hi, Rebecca. Something to be really mindful of is that a lot of the habits and routines that we set up, they are they are our um, mental health regulators. So like there's a reason why we've set up the routines that we have because they really balance out the stressors. And so when you quick tear out all the routines and the habits and all the stress goes up, you can see the all the impacts that we're, we're experiencing right now in terms of mental health. Oh, Priscilla has added, um, working out and strengthening yoga and meditation. Oh, so may, let me borrow that, um, Priscilla. Um, one of the points that I wanted to raise is that sometimes folks are reluctant because they already have a lot on their plate to be thinking about new habits when with everything that's going on. 
But in, um, in trying to reflect on, in preparation for this session, I thought about my most cherished habits and how and when I form them, just to kind of put them back into the front of my memory. I would say most all of them were established um, in a period of change. So the things that you normally do are, are not available or are not working for you anymore. And you're in a kind of a state of, of flux. And I find that's a perfect time for trying to set up something, something new. And I'm just checking here what people, more, more, more folks who are interested in yoga and meditation. Oh, and quitting smoking. Oh, those might be connected too. Exercise routine. So lots around, um, uh, lots around exercise, meditation, yoga, which are great picks for what's going on. And uh, so really interesting. I might go back one point, which is uh, step one I mentioned in the video was um, uh, confirming or identifying or clarifying your, your intention. And which sounds a lot like um, your motivation, which I said in the video is really not the driver of setting up new habits. That said, you're trying to clarify two things. One is it, am I ready to start this habit? Like, and am I truly interested in making this commitment to, to setting the wheels in motion? Mainly that's the intention you have to clarify, not the motivation to do all the steps, but like, am I really behind doing this thing? Like, do I, am I pretty committed to, I want to try meditating or yoga or exercise or reducing my, my waste uh, generation? And years ago, um, during residency, I worked in a health psychology department in a hospital and there was a lot of um, focus on behavior change and habit formation for health purposes, whether or not that was somebody who needed to change their exercise because of a, a coronary event or post-cancer or HIV or all of the health habits surrounding medical conditions. And one of the things I found so useful is that they would assess readiness for change. And um, I really have most of the models that I've been exposed to along the way, this is one that serves me, has served me for more than 20 years, which is to try and situate yourself on the readiness for change path. And it doesn't mean that it's a linear path because sometimes we move forward and circle back or we kind of speed ahead through the, through the phases. But some folks are trying to implement changes at too early a stage of readiness. So um, I mentioned in the video that sometimes people are like, you know, I should really lose weight or I should really um, start exercising, start running, start walking. And you can hear in the language they're not sure that they really want to do this. So this is this is either um, pre-contemplative, they call it, or contemplative, where it's like loosely on your radar as something you might want to do. And if that's the case, you might not be ready to start implementation of a habit, which could explain why a habit will fall apart because you're not already ready to start, but you've started. And so there's kind of a weakness in the system there of you're engaging somebody else's, what's the word, directive, not your own. So you first want to check in, am, am I pretty ready to do this? And, and then you can get into what am I ready to do? So a number of you have mentioned um, yoga or meditation or exercise. So after that, the step is, what is it that I want to implement? So um, any of those categories can be quite, quite broad. So you want to think about how could I say more specifically what it is I'm asking of myself in setting up this habit? So. Um, meditation is was one of my go-to's. It's something that I tried for the first time, uh, first time when high school, but established this habit, well established this habit about seven years ago. And it was after I had resigned from a job. And it was something I thought, hey, I want to start my day off feeling centered, feeling more calm, feeling more kind of grounded. And, and what I did, um, having done a bit of loose reading, was to find the simplest small ask 
that I could make um, with respect to meditation. And one suggestion I would make if you're trying meditation, for example, is in making the ask small, part of that is not to have to guide yourself through the process. So just sitting quietly in meditation all by yourself in your yoga spot, whether or not that's cross-legged or in a chair, and guiding yourself through the meditation actually asks a fair bit of yourself because you're guiding yourself through the meditation, which engages the thinking mind. It'll ask questions like, am I doing it right? Um, should I be having that thought? Or am I doing my own work if I start paying attention to this sensation or that? And so it gets noisy pretty quickly. So what you want to do if you're getting started is you probably want to set a really um, reasonable small ask. And I would recommend using a video um, or an app that you can simply follow. So, and then you can define it. I'm gonna start with two minutes a day. So classic meditation apps like Calm or Headspace, you can set your first 10 days like for a minute or two minutes of meditation. And as I was mentioning in the video, your, your whole goal, because we don't want heavy goals, your whole goal is to get started at first. So if you set up an app and you sat down for your meditation one minute per day and then two minutes per day, for example, you would already be on your way. And that would be the focus of it because if it gets to be too much, let me just see Priscilla wrote, setting specific goals within those like 10 minutes before bed. That's perfect. So um, yeah, that's a great example. So you can even, I, for my personal um, interest, I set mine at the beginning of the day, but others like to wrap their day or close their day with a meditation because they like the way that that kind of caps off the day and they go to sleep feeling calm and peaceful. And for me, it was like a way to kick off the day. So uh, what, what's really helpful is to say, this is specifically what I'm, what I'm gonna do, one or two or three or five minutes of meditation, a little bit more if you think it's manageable. And then placing it in the day is really useful. So to say, I'm gonna do this at the start of my day or before I go to bed, um, this, is my, this is my plan. And one thing to be on the alert for is to linger too long in trying to come up with uh, the perfect plan. So um, better to have a very small, simple, specific plan and adjust if you need to than to spend too much time um, working out the details in like an elaborate plan because it can fall, on, fall under its own weight. The other thing is the absence of a plan at all. <laughs> so um, when I work with clients one-on-one, -on -one, um, people will say like, right now people are working, some folks who are working from home are working all the time. Like they're working, they get up early, the computer's there, they start working right away and they're working till all hours and they're having a hard time setting boundaries, setting limits around the work day. And the cues are always there. So the computer's open, their desk is now their dining room table, and so they're having a hard time. So they say, I need to work, I need to work less. But there's no clarity around, you know, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm gonna finish at five, and I'm gonna leave the house and go for a walk. So that's where that setting the clear intention um, starts. Now I've moved into the second part of that, which is to, um, also th be thinking about how do I overcome, which was a big learning for me, the friction of starting. Yes, Gabby says, too much time figuring out how to start. I think that sometimes when people are contemplating, wh which is not terrible, when people are contemplating and thinking, how could this work? You just don't want to stay in that too long. You're better off just kicking it off and trying something. But there's a, there is a natural amount of contemplation. You just don't want to get stuck in it. Um, and somebody else said they found good guided meditation with um, the Buddhist Society of Australia. There's so much good free stuff out there right now, too. 
So when you're when you're starting, one of the best learnings, and and we put the the references in the um, in the invitation. I can make sure there that we don't need to repost them. I can post them again. But one of my favorite readings was really just learning about um, this thing called the friction of starting because people all often or most all feel really guilty um, when they are starting off that they feel like they're not doing it right and that they're giving up on it or they're self-sabotaging. There's all kinds of language around starting new habits when actually mainly it's um, normal that li achieving liftoff on a new habit it is very um, uh, labor intensive. And uh, some of that is because there's momentum pulled towards all kinds of other things that are already in, in motion. Also because we don't quite know what we're doing. And so we feel like we're fumbling around. And adults feeling like they're fumbling around, they don't like it. They feel very uncomfortable about feeling incompetent. So there's this like, uncomfortable zone of experimentation with new behavior and so everything is in the conscious processing uh, mind rather than in the routine and automation so at the beginning everything you're doing is trying to grease the wheel to get started so the definition of exactly what you're looking for the placement of it in the day um, the visual cues so I'm really big on visual cues. Um, if I'm trying to get something done or make it a part of my routine, there are visual clue clues, uh, whether or not those are stickets, stickums I put on my bathroom mirror or in my workspace or on the door or on my shoes that are saying, reminder, you have this in uh, intention today. And so it helps you to not just kind of fall into your normal routine and lose sight of that intention altogether. So the that's a visual cues are a form of cue just like placement in the day when I get up I'm going to go into my chair and I'm going to meditate is a cue that is a placement in the day is the cue for example um, reminds me that um, when I was talking about how difficult the early days are um, it makes me think a little bit more about the mindset piece, which I think gets in a lot of people's way where they're, they have a lot of expectation early on for what is a relatively new habit and will give up quickly because um, it feels uncomfortable to feel incompetent and to not know what you're doing. And uh, whether or not that's exercise or whether or not that's meditation, the performing mind likes to get really involved and start asking questions and start undermining confidence and intention with like, am I doing it right? Is this the right thing? Um, I'm not sure about this methodology, if this is going to get me the results and so on. And it's, it's helpful if you're engaging in a mindful meditation process, whether or not that's for meditation or for running or walking, to be aware that those thoughts and questions are normal <laughs> but not helpful so if you can engage with them mindfully which is basically to acknowledge their presence and um and say ah okay i'm doing the thing where i start asking performance questions early on because i'm feeling uncomfortable about what i'm doing and to let them go and come back to practicing, they don't need to be so disruptive. So these are one of the things that can shut down a new habit are a lot of questions and too high performance standards when there is no performance yet because you're just putting the wheels in motion. And so I remember years ago starting running and I, for whatever reason, didn't have my gym membership and felt a strong need to get out and burn off some energy and some stress and just put on my running shoes and ran around the block and I'd never really been a runner and thought is that it like is that running <laughs> and in the early days it is it's like if you manage to put on your running shoes and kind of move yourself around the block 
in a rough running motion, then it's running. Same thing with med meditation. If you sit in your chair and you put on your app and you listen and follow along and do the things that they're saying, you are meditating. And so you really want to be super gentle and easygoing about the feedback and the questions that you're engaging in. And it would it'd be great if you could share some of your early experiences about what you've been running into as you try on <clears throat> your new habits so we could tackle what some of the obstacles are. But I would say that is one of the main obstacles is that <clears throat> people get very judgy <laughs> when they're starting a new habit and if they don't feel like they're doing it right. So part of it's getting it started. And then once it's even a little bit started, people get very judgy around the quality or the standards or the methodology <clears throat> too soon. And so it's not until you've got a decent wheel going that you want to get too fussed up about um, how well you're executing or the methodology or the technique and so on. And there's tons of stuff out there that can guide you on all of those things. <clears throat> so once you get into it and you're starting to give yourself constructive uh, feedback, then that's a good time to go looking at um, techniques and how you can make improvements. Um, but that's kind of a bonus more than a requirement to get the habit loop uh, started. So very low ask very low expectations, um, clear placement in the day. And then layered in there are, which always makes people feel like, kind of like they're back in school, <clears throat> is to be thinking about um, tracking and rewards. So when you're thinking about um, trying to keep it going, let me just check here, because I think some comments have come in. Natalie, how long would you say is best to stick to the basics? Oh, I have a new habit. When things start to get too complicated, when the gym instructor changes my routine after one week, I tend to give up. <clears throat> so I th that's a great question. So um, Natalie's saying, how long do you stay in the early phase? And again, I would say I would do anything to sustain the habit. If when you complicated, complicate it or make uh, increase the level of difficulty and you can sense, this is where the mindfulness comes in, you can detect that you're becoming less interested in doing it because it got too complicated or too demanding too fast. Go back to square zero. So if, if um, that additional level of difficulty or complexity is discouraging the habit from happening, I wouldn't add it or I would go back to the step before. And this is a really good point around sustainability. And I would make a distinction here. So I happen to have a default for long-term sustainable stuff. I just like, probably too much sometimes, I take the long view of things. And so when I'm putting something in motion, I'm immediately thinking about how do I, how am I gonna make this stick? And for that, the, the sustained effort is your friend. So if that sustained effort is small for a long time before you then gently increase that that is going to help your sustainability. Whereas people who get too complicated or too demanding too fast, the habit breaks and then they've lost it altogether. So you're better going slow and sustained and incremental improvement than too much too fast because most people's reaction to that is going to give up, is going to be to give up. And a little bit of a nuance on that is that not all things that you're going to be trying right now because we're in a very experimental time where we're <clears throat> exploring a whole bunch of things you might not intend all of them to become part of your life so some things might be simple explorations and then if you go on a saturday and try something out and it doesn't stick it doesn't matter because you were just checking it out so the ha the tips that i'm talking about today are those things that you're trying to make part of your life your lifestyle rather than the thing you're just checking out. Because if you just check something out and you overdo it or it gets too complicated and you drop it, it doesn't matter. So for sustainability, these are the ones that, that stick. And then Priscilla says, obstacle is negative self-talk, inner critic. Too much focus on getting the results and seeing the outcome. I find myself getting, uh, I find 
I found getting myself focused on the process rather than the outcome is key. It's about building momentum and getting an energy um, flowing. That is absolutely so key. So I would say if I'm to talk about kind of my one-on-one -on -one coaching around any of this, the biggest derailer is um, self-talk, is self-criticism. If you can take in the um, uh, Duhigg, Charles Duhigg, who writes on habits, he talks about the scientist mind. So if you take scientist mind, which is very similar to observing mind and, and mindfulness, if you, the most you can do to observe your um, observe yourself without judgment. So just observe to be interested and curious around when I do this, this happens. When I do that, that happens. As opposed to, oh, well, now you've done it or, you know, you said you were motivated, but you're like all that kind of negative self-talk that Priscilla was just talking about is really unhelpful. And so you don't want to get on your own case about even having negative self-talk. You want to be alert to it and saying, ah, okay, I just started doing that thing, not helpful. Let me get focused back on reps. So one of the things I mentioned in the, in the video is that at the front end, your biggest friend is the number of repetitions, the continuity, the, the shifting from conscious processing to automation. And the more you repeat, the more you're establishing those neural pathways, the easier it becomes the more comfortable you um, you start to feel, and this is when this is when motivation can start to kick in. So, as I mentioned before, people are expecting motivation before they've even started habit formation, which is when it's non-existent. Because motivation forms because it's reinforcing, which means it can't already be present before you've even started. Motivation shows up later. Now. As we repeat, 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 this is when we start to notice, hey, I kind of get it a little bit more <clears throat> and it feels good. So when I started running or dancing or meditating, you have that moment of realization, hey, this is a little bit easier than before and I think I'm getting somewhere. So that I think I'm getting somewhere or this feels easier, I'm breathing more easily or I can do this a little bit further than I did before or with less effort, less, less complexity or less, it's less taxing on me. Um, one of the things that is a, a driver of, of um, happiness, um, when they look at the factors that drive uh, happiness and from in positive psychology, one of the five axes or core drivers of happiness is achievement, accomplishment, progress. That's a whole little um, bundle. And so that sense of repetition showing us that we're progressing is a strong reinforcer. So if you focus on process and repetition, you will see progress. And if you're mindful to that and noticing, hey, this is getting easier, the rewards start to kick in and you start to want to do it more because you're getting that feeling of, of um, self-efficacy, which is also a driver of motivation and emotional well-being. So that repeat the chain, repeat the chain, repeat the chain is what starts to um, build motivation and re reinforcement reward into it. So that keeping it easy, keeping it process oriented is, uh, is really key. So um, to, similarly to borrow on, on Priscilla's point around goals and outcomes, um, uh, James Clear in his, he's got a website you can check out and it's got all kinds of great free information about building habits. He also wrote a book called um, The Atomic Habits. And in it, he talks about three levels um, uh, around habit formation. And the very first level is, and the most fragile, is outcome-based habit formation. And so we all have examples in our personal lives. We all know folks in our social circles who they set out a goal, they achieve it, it's over. <laughs> so I'm going to run uh, five kilometers, and they run 5K, and they never run again. Which, if that was your goal, and the only thing you wanted out of it to mark something to say, I'm capable of doing this, and you want to show it to yourself, and you're done, perfect. If you wanted running to become part of your life, not, not a great approach to take because that's what 
too sharp or too um, strict a goal will do is that after it's accomplished, the habit tends to fall off because you're like, I'm there, I'm at the finish line. Whereas a process, which is the next level of habit formation process oriented, keeps the wheel going. And so you become in this mode of this is what I do. I engage in this and the more I engage in this, the more effective I become. And it starts to build the foundation for the, the most sustainable, most deep, deeply integrated habits, which are identity focused. <clears throat> so identity focused would say, you know, this is part of who I am. This is part of like, I am a meditator. I am a, a runner. I am a fit. I'm a fit person. I am somebody, I am a, an environmentally conscious person. I am an organized person. And so that, that behavior, maybe starting with one, but expanding into several, <clears throat> it gets so anchored into who the person is that they, they feel more like th themselves. They feel like a bigger version of themselves by um, experiencing that habit. <clears throat> and they also feel less like themselves if they don't engage in it. So it feels at odds with them not to do it. And I would think in that case, I think, for example, about artists who, who, who identify at some point as an artist, but when they stop creating, when they stop producing, they stop feeling like an artist because artists produce, they create is kind of a strong association. So you want it so anchored in that, that it's, it also kind of spurs that action to do, to do more of it. Okay. So thank you for posting the, the Charles uh, Duhigg. So those are kind of some of the ways to think at the front end around how you set it up and how you put them, the wheels um, in motion. So one of the things I was going to say a few more words about was around the, um, once you've gotten the wheel uh, started, uh, you had pointed out like, okay, when do we want to start to increase the complexity? Part of it is when you have a little bit of appetite. So you start to get your base down. Sometimes you've got it down and you're like, eh. So you're looking for a bit more of a challenge. You're looking to get into technique or methodology. So you don't have to make it all at once complicated across the board, but you might decide on some days to um, increase your time or to increase uh, the, dur not the duration or the distance um, or change the circumstances because you're starting to think about um, transfer, you're starting to think about expanding on technique, on skills around it. So then you can start to, once it's stabilized and it feels pretty embedded um, and pretty routine, then you can start to, to build on that. When it's in that stable period is also um, a time when you can um, use your mindfulness techniques if you have some to start to notice um, uh, the benefits. So up front, um, those benefits are not tangible to us, one, because um, we're not doing them. And often, they are masked by the, the derailers. So when we're trying something new and we feel um, uncomfortable, that is really tangible. So we are we have a biased wiring for noticing those things that are threatening including ego threats. So, you know, I notice this a lot when we're out dancing is that um, there's so much um, criticism um, around I'm not doing it right and the others are getting it and I'm not getting it and all that kind of stuff. Like you can you can actually see people's wheels turning and the, all the, the judgment and criticism going on. Um, and that gets a lot of disproportionate focus in the mind is that discomfort, that those comparisons, those judgments. And so as, as quickly as you possibly can, you want to turn your attention to what did feel good about it. So one of the early um, feel good, feel, feel good moments of habits when you're, when it's formative is completion, which is, um, we talk about lead measures and lag measures um, when you're talking about how you track or how you monitor yourself. And, and a lead measure is really um, doing what you said you were going to do. So if you plan to go for a walk that day or meditate for two minutes 
or um, try a new um, uh, yoga video, whatever the case might have been, regardless of quality or even if you were judging yourself or even if you felt really incompetent, at the end of that, to recognize, hey, I got it done, which is reinforcing in and of itself because there's alignment between intention and action. And humans like that. Humans do really well when they're feeling aligned. So if you set a clear intention and you accomplish it, then you, there is this natural um, feeling of synchronicity or of alignment that people find reinforcing. You can help that by having some form of monitoring. So um, I, I know I'm trying to do monitor a lot of things. I will have a big white sheet also out visibly with days of the week where I note what I got done of my intention on that day. And uh, I, think, I think James Clare talked about it on his website, but he talked about the Jerry Seinfeld, I think he calls it the Jerry Seinfeld method, which is, you know, when they interview Jerry Seinfeld, because he's one of the most successful um, comedians out there, um, they ask him about how he became so good at what he does. And he says, well, comedians, write jokes like they perform jokes which means they have to write jokes and so he writes jokes every day and he has kind of an old-fashioned calendar and every day that he writes jokes he crosses it off on the calendar so when I'm using that method I think I'm using the Jerry Seinfeld method but so it shows you visibly feedback to yourself that you honored the intention over and above that it's super fun and I don't know why but it's um, especially fun for humans to get strings of accomplishment or completion. So if you do these big X's and you see a string, um, we don't like breaking strings. So there's this extra constructive tension that we feel about breaking a string. So you'll notice whether or not it's in your yoga app or your meditation app or and built into your training program is that there's there's this, it's a setup to show, give feedback to you. You've, you've meditated one day in a row, two days in a row, three days in a row. And we're really motivated to keep that going. So you might use a visual string to give yourself um, feedback that you're tracking. And then that starts to get your attention and at least balances the attention between discomfort and criticism and that feeling of honoring intention and accomplishment and progress. So you have at least... Um, balanced feedback coming in. I'll add one more, um, one more little piece around that. Another way that I self monitor is that there's a there's a technique in positive psychology that you might already be familiar with, which is called the three good things. And at the end of each day, you, um, I, I, if I were to prescribe it, which is where I prescribed it to myself, I place it at the end of the day before I go to sleep. And I think about what are the three best moments of the day. And when I'm in active habit formation, invariably, one of my three good things that I, my attention will go to and that I put my attention to is what I manage to do of my intention around that habit. So you're, you're making a, a, um, a deliberate or putting deliberate attention to encode. So they, they, they and they studied this neurologically that when we place our attention on it, it encodes that event in our, in our mind, in our brains, and that having that um, encoding actually affects um, our emotional well-being. So not only does it keep the habit alive, it starts to feed you know, positive emotion and reinforcement into the system. So having some form of monitoring, whether or not it's a written chart with X's, whether or not it's a mindful attention at the end of each day to notice what went well, you're deliberately dividing attention between criticism, discomfort, and judgment, and, and diverting or shifting attention onto progress, many achievements, um, alignments with values and intentions. And so you take attention away from the negative and you shift it onto the positive, which really is one of the sustainers of, of, um, of habits. So that's another practice that you can consider. The other fun thing that I would call your attention to, um, I'm just going to see if you have, and do, do shoot in your, your questions or your comments or your reflections on how you're thinking about your habits as I'm saying this, like what's coming to mind, 
or where you think there might be some trouble spots that I can that I can help you with. Um, so um, keep keep chatting as we go, and I'll keep chatting as we go in case you don't have any just yet. Um, one thing that I like is I like noticing the positive surprises. Sometimes there's negative surprises. Things are harder than we thought or more complicated. Um, but there's also positive surprises. So when you're engaging in a habit, try to notice unexpected pleasant things or unexpected um, positive outcomes. So if I were to use an example um, uh, for meditation, I went in trying to find a method that would start my day off on the right path and then um, and then kind of instill a sense of calm or centeredness for the rest of the day that I needed to plan out. What I found as an accidental benefit is I started to notice how much details um, shifted for me. So I'm walking down the street, I start noticing things more, like noticing colors, noticing sounds, noticing sensations like wind or heat on the skin and I was like oh so it, it what it does is it, it expands it expands the benefits so we go in with certain intended benefits but we notice there are corollary benefits that were unanticipated but nonetheless very rewarding but because sometimes because we're not expecting them we don't pay attention to them so you can deliberately um, place some of your attention on those um, on those habits so that are on those benefits so that it becomes part of the reward package so like oh isn't this cool not only am I feeling grounded and centered but I feel like I feel more attentive to the world around me to the colors to the beauty to the sensations that I have because I engage in this and that becomes like an unexpected additional benefit that you can leverage to sustain the habit because how great is that and it makes you um, want to keep that in your life because of these additional reasons that you never set out to accomplish but but there they are let me just check maybe you can shoot in some of your questions around where you are getting stuck either getting started or keeping um, your habit uh, going um, I will tell you that um, one of my successful habits, uh, COVID habits, was that um, I, and it was a funny, it's funny happenstance. So if I go back to the observer scientist model, um, what I love about his book is that you need to be a really keen observer to see what's working well that you can leverage and when it falls apart, why it falls apart. And and not to engage the critical mind, the self-critical mind, to observe the curious, scientific, adjust your mind. So, um, for example, when I um, shifted in my started shifting habits for COVID, one of the things I was doing was dancing in a social situation, taking classes, social dancing with partner, and I was like concerned that if I didn't go there, that it would my basic footwork, my basic enjoyment would just go right out the window. So what I did was when I would get up in the morning and I would get dressed, um, because we were talking like this, it wouldn't matter, but I always put dancing shoes on at the, like at 7 a.m. So that when I would walk around, go take a break, I would see the, the shoes and I would remind myself, oh yeah, I was going to take dance breaks and I would play dance music in the background. So it's visually present and it's easy um, and it, I've built it so that it can fit into the day and I have multiple opportunities to, to try it out. <clears throat> what happened recently is that um, it got hot. So my, my habit of putting on closed, laced up shoes um, fell off. So I, and I started putting like flip flops and going barefoot because it was so much more comfortable. So there are these points where <clears throat> the environmental conditions change. So like with the heat, that, um, that threw me off and it took me some days to realize, oh, wait a minute, I forgot about my habit and then can circle back to, I wonder why that fell off. And then I realized it was footwear because my practice was cued by the footwear and my footwear changed. So I lost my habit <clears throat> because it's new for me. I don't normally dance at home. I dance. It's one of the things I do with peeps. It's not something I do by myself normally. 
So you might really leverage that observational mind when you start something and find out um, whether a change in environment or change in circumstances. So like adding a buddy, is that helpful or unhelpful? So if you're a runner, sometimes people who run with a buddy feel a positive tension of somebody's expecting them. They've committed to somebody else over and above to kidding, committing to themselves. So they're more likely to do it. So they um, having a buddy helps. I found at, at various points when I would add a buddy, um, I, I, would, I was dis less inclined. And what it made me aware of is what was my driver for running is that I get up, I put on my shoes, I go. And so if I wake up and then I have to wait because it's 30 minutes before I would have run with a buddy or like I have to go meet somebody, we just have to walk there and then run, it actually disrupted some of my core drivers for my habits. So adding buddy in actually reduced my likelihood of doing it. So no judgment on buddies. It was just for me, that formula didn't work. So you can play with the different variables that can, can be useful and then see, are they useful? So if I plan it for the start of the day, like I, I meditate in the morning partly because there's construction it feels like all the time on my street and having construction as my background for meditating doesn't please me. So I get up early, but if I got up early and I was too sleepy and I kept falling asleep during my meditation, I wouldn't feel um, as satisfied with my practice. So I might move it. What if I tried it on my lunch hour or as somebody else is practicing? What if I practiced it at night as a way to cap off my day? Would that feel, would that work any better? So that's really kind of that experimental, observational, um, continuous uh, improvement mentality that can help um, make the adjustments that are likely going to come up uh, during the day. Um, do we have any more? Let me just check to see if I have any more questions. So I don't think any so far. Um, so let me try and think if there's, I'm just going to look, see if there's any things that I had. Uh, the, okay, the other thing, um, another mindset piece that might be useful is that um, in the last one of these sessions I, I had done, I was talking about um, growth versus um, fixed mindset. And one of the things that gets in the people's way, um, two things, one is people have Sometimes they have identities that feel at odds with their intentions. So um, they're trying to get an exercise habit going, but they see themselves as kind of a more sedentary person. And so there's this inherent um, paradox in their identity between what they're intending and who they are. So this is one of those, it's a fixed mindset, um, what's the word, marker or signal that we have viewed ourselves as as a certain type of person and that the habit we're trying to engage in feels at odds. And this is really just a mind limitation because if you do the things um, in the, you know, you're following the exercise program or you're doing the meditation or whatever it is you're intending, then there isn't any reason other than perhaps lack of experience or skills or guidance or whatever you need to not be able to expand yourself view to include that but it's one of those things that will crop up when you're practicing a habit that can get in your own way because when it's effortful and this is an effort what's how did how did she describe it um our attitude about effort can get in the way so many people feel like if it's too effortful it's because i'm not meant to do this it's because i'm not natural at this it's because I'm not good at this. And so it's not for me. And so it can be related to the mindset around effort is bad, which is when you're forming a new habit, effort is absolutely normal. So not to get into a negative reputation that if it's effortful, that it's because it's not me, it's not for me, I'm not capable of it. It's more just the frustration about being feeling incompetent. Um, last time somebody mentioned um, learning a new language. Like adults have a really hard time learning a new language because we're so proficient in our first language that when we get into feeling awkward and uncomfortable, we're very intolerant of that. And so we start to say, ah, 
I guess I'm not like a languages person and this is never going to work and it kind of gets pitched out. So you want to be very mindful of, you know, labels. I'm a this kind of person, but I'm not that kind of person. Or if I'm putting this much effort in, it must mean that I'm not very good at that. So you can be alert to some of the typical traps or derailers that people run into when um, there's trying to start something new and that discomfort shows up. On the whole, people like grown-ups are pretty intolerant with that discomfort and likely to check out as a way to manage that discomfort rather than pushing through the discomfort, changing the formula, changing the methodology to help them to persist through the, the discomfort. Okay, Priscilla, how to sustain that deliberate attention towards your progress thoughts um, and away from negative self-talk? Any practices that can help with developing the observing mind? Is continuity and repetition key until it eventually sticks in our minds? Oh, I love that question. Um, so how to develop the observer mind? And I, I would say one of the most useful things I've ever done was to learn mindful meditation. So mindful meditation is not the only form of meditation, but it's a really useful one that actually, um, actually, I don't know what that word means, that's really helpful around all your other habits because it develops the muscle to observe yourself without judgment. So when you're in a mindful um, meditation practice, no matter what arises, the training is to, no matter what arises, you've placed your attention on your breath, it's gonna get carried off with this thought, then so this sensation or that other emotion, you're noticing that it's happened and you're coming back over time without judgment. So. I place my attention, my attention leaves, I come back, and that's it. No getting on your own case, no evaluation or net assessment of what's gone wrong. Attention leaves, bring attention back. So one of the useful um, enablers um, or muscle builders of the observer, non-judgmental mind is mindful um, meditation. But you can also generally engage in the practice of hearing your thoughts. So um, for many years now, I've been working on uh, cognitive behavioral approaches where there's fundamental to the approach is a recognition that the thoughts are the generator of emotions and of behavior choices. So if we set out down a path, our thoughts get all involved in negotiation, in commentary, in criticism, in negativity. We start feeling a certain way, uncomfortable, frustrated, um, emotionally down, low self-esteem because we're feeling unconfident, behavior stops or behavior derailment. So those behavior, which is the habits, are at the end of that chain. So being able to influence upstream the thinking patterns and keeping those observational, if not positive, neutral or balanced would be a good start. Positive would be great if you can work toward it. So one of the things that you can do to develop that capacity, I find if it's mindful meditation practice is one way of building the muscle. Another is to do um, kind of debriefs or deconstruction when you start feeling very emotionally activated. For example, when you're trying your habit and it just collapses to trace back to just before that, what was the chain? So I set out, I put my shoes on, I, I don't know, I got down to the sidewalk and then somebody was watching me or as the neighbors came out at the same time I did. And then I started thinking, oh no, they're seeing me running, they're gonna think I'm incompetent or blah, blah, blah whatever. Something engages that then gets, in, gets the mind very busy, critical, involved. And then I started feeling uncomfortable, discouraged. And then the next day I was like, worried looking out the window, I hope I don't come out again. So whenever there's um, um, some activation, often that's emotional activation that's got us kind of feeling stuff, you can take that moment to tap into what was I thinking? And without judgment, just to say, okay, it started here and then my thoughts got involved. They started thinking this, this and that, started feeling discouragement and frustration, wanted to stop. So that's that scientific mind that says, what's the pattern? Like, how are these pieces connected that can help me develop my capacity 
to hear my own thoughts. And the mindful movement helps you to just say, ah, I hear that. I'm going to put that down now. And I'm going to come back to what I was doing without judgment. Chris, how do you get the energy to implement regular good habits when you suffer from anxiety and insomnia? Okay. Sleep often becomes priority when it finally comes and then your schedule plans get thrown off. The more I try to think about sleeping, the harder it is to fall asleep. So when I try to add good habits, I'm more aware that I'm doing so and trying so hard to fall asleep, that keeps me awake. Oh, isn't that like the inherent cruelty to working on sleep habits is that the worst thing for sleep is focusing on sleep the, or the attention that we put on sleep, it becomes very um, difficult to then, so winding down and feeling more relaxed about sleep, enables sleep and feeling unduly focused on sleep um, gets the mind really busy, which keeps us awake. So when it comes to, when it comes to sleep, um, I wasn't sure if you're putting good habits around sleep or good habits plus sleep, but I'll, I'll, I'll tackle them separately. So we're just talking about sleep habits in and of themselves. When I work with folks who, who regularly um, suffered from insomnia, a very normal thing that happens is you start feeling anxious about sleeping. So as the day wears on, and as you start to approach the evening, the thinking mind starts to get involved and start to say, I hope I fall asleep. I really sure hope I fall asleep because tomorrow I've got a big presentation in the morning and I really need to be rested. So I better fall asleep. I better not have one of those. And so the busyness of the mind um, is part of what will perpetuate um, sleep difficulties. So part of that um, is being able to um, recognize those as thoughts. So if you are, for example, going to meditate, you might decide to meditate in the evening and use a sleep-based meditation, not to put you to sleep, but one that recognizes there's a lot of people who are working on sleep habits. So a lot of meditation apps have a sleep-specific app. And its intention, if you, if you don't overanalyze because that's not helpful, but you might notice when you listen to a sleep meditation that the movement that it's trying to engender is a wind down. Okay, so you know you're preparing for sleep, and your um, your mind you're trying to like it's trying to unpack the mind. It's trying to like let the mind wind down. So you might use um, the the app as a way as an aid to try and facilitate that movement of in the evening. What I'm doing is um, letting go of the events um, of the day, and also. You're probably using that time to notice anxious thoughts about sleeping. So an anxious thought about sleeping is, oh, what if I don't fall asleep? Or I sure hope I do fall asleep because I have to fall asleep because the last time I didn't fall asleep. So you're noticing the anxious thought, which is normal when you have sleep disruption that you would have these anxious thoughts, but you're trying not to chase them. You're trying to notice them as a thought, like, a diff like another thought and say, ah, there's that thought. Like the other thoughts, I'm gonna put that down and I'm going to come back to my meditation. So you can use placement of your meditation or your exercise. Sometimes people use breathing. Um, you place it strategically as you prepare into the evening to try and wind down the thoughts and wind down the body. The other habit around sleep that's highly recommended um, is that you strongly associate your bedroom with sleep. So if, if the thoughts get wound back up when you get into bed, you come back out of the bedroom and you might decide what are the things, good habits that I put in place when I'm feeling aroused or overstimulated around bedtime that I can put out here in my living room or in my kitchen that I can engage to again help the, wind, the mind wind down whether or not that's reading a book or a little craft or having a tea or listening to some music. And so that when the mind starts to settle again, I'll go back into, so that the associations are clear because those are the cues. When I go into my room, cue sleep, I wind down, I go to sleep. If I don't, I come out here where it's okay to be a little bit more stimulated because it's normally a stimulation environment. Then I go back in and I start to establish it. The other thing I've found helpful for folks who have sleep disruption 
is um, uh, is is having a coping plan. So people who who struggle from sleep like from insomnia or different ways of different forms of sleep disruption have dealt with that a lot, unfortunately. But it also means they have coped through it a lot. So if your mind goes to what if I don't sleep, you want to be more in a mind of I'm going to get the sleep I can get, the more the better, and to not anticipate all the negative outcomes. So to not, this is negative, a negative thought habit, like somebody was mentioning earlier, like a, a negative pad, thought pattern, is to get into um, catastrophizing. If this happens, then that's going to happen, then that's going to happen, which adds more anxiety into the system, more stimulation, more difficulty falling asleep. So if you have the thought, I hope I fall asleep, or I better fall asleep, or what if I don't fall asleep, you want to shift that pattern into I'm going to sleep. I'm going to get all the sleep I can get. And if I'm tired in the morning or if I didn't get all the sleep I'm going to get, I, I would like to have gotten, here's how I'm going to handle things because you have handled them before. It's not optimal, but you have experience. We've all had those experience, whether it's because of anxiety, because of construction, because of babies, because of whatever, where our sleep was disrupted and we had to function. And we did. It was not optimal, but we did. But the mind goes to, I know how to do this if that happens. In the meantime, it's that mindful movement. I'm coming back to try and help myself get the best sleep that I can get today. So that's um, those are some of the ideas that we see around good um, sleep habits to to uh, to facilitate that. The other thing I heard recently um, from a sleep expert is trying to focus on what time you get up. So I often focus on trying to get to bed at a decent hour so I have a chance at accumulating enough hours of sleep because I don't sleep a long time. Um, but her recommendation was to um, always get up at the same time. So to try and set yourself buffers at, 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 both, at both ends. So when you get up regularly, your body gets used to. So even if you're tired, it gets used to getting up at a certain time and um, and uh, getting into good functioning. And so it becomes a habit to wake up and your body learns that habit and automatically goes into a more functional mode. She also mentioned that what we do when we get up is part of the habits that helps the body wake up. So the shower that changes your body temperature, getting dressed, putting the, the normal um, parameters in place rather than staying in bed to try to compensate and getting the whole routine derailed um, you can think about, I'm still going to engage in my habits, um, even if my sleep is disrupted, because it's going to help the rest of my day. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's it's 1 o'clock, and um, I'm so glad that you dropped by to talk about the habits that you're working on. Um, feel free, if there's um, a particular follow-on topic that you would think would be useful, to drop that in the comment box. But um, Otherwise, I'm going to wrap up here and, uh, and thank you all for joining me for this lunchtime session. And hopefully I will see you again. Take care. Bye.